What is up, everyone? Brandon First, a.k.a. First Report, representing the Off the Bench Podcast Network. It is time for another episode of The Change Up, our 10th episode here, little mini milestone right there, with myself, Brandon First, a.k.a. First Report. You can find me at First Report, F-E-R-S-T, Report on Twitter. And, of course, my co-host, Miss Brianna Winner. You can find her at Winner 12 Brianna, how are you doing today? doing good a lot of these trades that we're hearing are getting crazy but i'm hoping that now angels have enough to get bauer (laughs) yeah definitely i think honestly in the last week the angels were definitely the most active team uh and we will get to that in a moment but plenty to get to last week was a little bare the cupboards were a little bare we're not gonna lie we made most of it talked about some free agents stuff like that we definitely have some news to get to, some trades, as Brianna talked about. And we really start to get into, you know, the the meat of things. Obviously, we don't have the winter meetings. Uh, Now they're the winter Zoom meetings, which, you know, the deals still get done, you know, whether you're in person or not. But the winter meetings always seem to uh, grease the wheels a little bit. So we'll see if the winter Zoom meetings can do the same. But before we get into really kind of Major League Baseball side of things, some news that came down from the International Olympic Committee, uh, pretty much, I guess, finalizing what a lot of us have already known um, or expected, I should say, that baseball will not be a part of the lineup in the 2024 Olympics that will be in uh, Paris. So very interesting news there. Baseball has been on the chopping block, I feel like, my entire life. (laughs) Uh, the fact Wait. that it gets replaced with breakdancing is a bit uh, 2020. I'll tell you, that might be cool. peak 2020. Uh, Brianna was actually the one who brought up the breakdancing to me uh, this week. That blew my mind. Brianna, what are your what are your thoughts on uh, the IOC pretty much saying that uh, baseball is not an Olympic sport? Well, no, I think I know what the reasoning is for. But going back, obviously, they got rid of baseball, softball, and the Olympics in 2008. Uh, after those Olympics, then they finally are coming back for 2020. Obviously Japan is a huge baseball, softball country and Europe is not, which is why I think they're getting rid of it for Paris because there's not really going to be a home team at all. But then you've got 2028 in Los Angeles, which I'm assuming they're going to try to bring those two sports back, knowing how big of a community there is in the United States um, so I think that was the reasoning for it. Yes, break dancing, I don't agree with um, at all. But I mean, I had talked to Coach uh, Tariah Flowers from CSUN, who is no longer there and is now at Loyola Marymount, um, about it when I interviewed her um, over a year ago about her becoming an, an assistant coach on the national team. And that was basically also one of her reasonings was all, that Europe is not a big country. And she's just, dis- she's sad and disappointed that it won't be in, that it wasn't on the short list for 2024, but in 2028, they should be able to bring it back. I understand. I, I, I understand the reasoning. I, I think break dancing is a little bit like, excuse me. It's kind of, I would say um, there, there's always kind of those events that you go, wait, that's going on. I mean, speed walking, if you've ever gotten a chance to see the speed walking, that's a ridiculous thing, but Hey, um, apparently the entire world loves speed walking, but for me, it's, it, I think they need to change the name of the event or the, 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 the thing it's cause it's no longer the Olympics. It's now, lo- it's now the international most popular sport in this country every four years. It, that's, that's what it is. That's fine. But um, it's not the Olympics. It's now, Oh, where are we on the map? Um, how do we get that done? So uh, I mean, for the, for the G- break dancers of the world, congratulations. You have uh, four years to get yourself together uh, and uh, go for gold. But I, I, I mean, don't agree with any of uh, any of the above. For Japan, I believe one of the ones that they're adding is surfing. Um, I don't know what I don't remember what the rest of them were, but I know surfing is definitely big in Japan and it hasn't been an Olympic sport before, but I know it's getting bigger among um, obviously countries that are near water. Definitely. Like Australia, Australia, I know it's big because oh. I learned to surf there and I only stood up once, so. 
Hey, that's one more time than me. And I have a lot of surfer buddies who have tried very, very hard to get me up on that board, but I tried to tell them and they realized eventually that I am a land animal. Uh, I will watch from the beach and, and go, wow, that was awesome. But yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm just glad they got a picture of the one time that I stood up. <laughs> hey, that's, that's it. If they got one picture of that, you can say that you stood up 10 times, you know, you can kind of milk it a little bit, but uh, with surfing, I, I could somewhat understand now, I'm not 100% sure on this, but I do believe that when surfing does come to the Olympics, it will be in some sort of controlled environment. I don't think it's going to be out on the beach. I think it's going to be a wave pool, a situation like that, a controlled, you know, because um, in surfing, you know, like I said, growing up with a lot of buddies, I've watched a lot of uh, trestles down here, lower trestles, seen a lot of events there. Um, with some of the best in the world. And a lot of what it is, is is the luck of what waves you get. So with the Olympics, I think they have to kind of control that. Obviously, if you were doing it on the uh, out in the ocean, then yes, some landlocked countries wouldn't be able to have it. But I think it's just the fact that break dancing takes over for baseball. It's, it's a little bit of a salt in the wound, but we move on because you know what, at the end of the day, we can um, talk about this for hours. <laughs> exactly. And we're not doing that. Uh, as you can tell, I'm already getting a little heated. So moving on to Major League Baseball, some news that came on, uh, came down from the big office, pretty much getting the teams ready for the 2021 season that the Universal DH will not be returning. This is at least for the 2021 season. I think it's always been on the docket or at least something to be talked about. 2020 was a interesting time. They had to kind of throw it in there. What are your thoughts on the universal DH uh, kind of a one and done, at least so far? I mean, I'm pretty sure the American league pitchers love this, <laughs> that it's not going to be back uh, mostly because they don't have to hit anymore, or at least um, of, if they ever did hit, obviously Shohei Otani is a difference, but I mean, for the national league, I feel like nothing's really going to change. Because obviously their pitchers are still allowed to hit. So I th that's basically what I got. Yeah, I, I think it's going to change kind of the way the game's played again. All of a sudden, those bench players in the National League are going to be more – they're, they're used more. You're going to see double switches. I, that's the whole thing. That's the one thing I missed from this, this entire year was the double switches, the the things like that. And a lot of people kind of roll their eyes, and that's fine. Uh, I people probably don't tune in and I don't really even tune in to watch baseball to see double switches, but it's part of the strategy of it. You, you get to kind of see the uh, managerial side and obviously guys like, you know, Zach Grinke and Madison Bumgarner, they're going to be excited. Not only the fact that they don't have to face DHs uh, in all national league games, but they're going to be able to hit. And uh, Madison Bumgarner absolutely loves to swing the bat uh, interesting to see. And now with Trevor Bauer, I've been kind of talking about it with Bauer signing and all that. I can't wait. I, I want Trevor Bauer to go somewhere where he plays the Astros as much as possible with him being a starting pitcher, you know, anywhere in the division, you're probably going to get two or three starts maximum anywhere outside the division. You're going to hope that your number is called when you come up against them. But anyways, with this coming up, I was very interested to see if Trevor Bauer um, would would want to maybe face the Astros pitchers uh, at the dish and with the no universal DH in the National League, obviously. Trevor Bauer, maybe. Does he want to step up to play? I don't think he does, um, but I did look it up. The National League Central does play the American League West in interleague play. So if he does want to play in the, uh, does want to play the Astros, but stay in the National League, he'll have to do it in the Central. Um, I don't think that will happen. I, I still think the, uh, the Angels are the um, main main pick. And uh, I think uh, Brianna would agree with me on that. Oh yes, very much so. <laughs> Moving on to, I kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier ago, uh, the, the most active team of the week, really, at least in terms of bringing players in. There were plenty of players that were non-tendered, uh, plenty of teams who were active in that situation, but bringing players in, it would be the uh, Anaheim Angels. And yes, I know it's the Los Angeles Anaheim, uh, Angels of Anaheim, but I call them the Anaheim Angels. They bring in a couple players, uh, send it over to Brianna to give us a little more um, in-depth stuff uh, with the two new Halos who actually, you know, uh, are not related, but you could easily be uh, confused by that. So the Angels have acquired a pitcher, Raisel Iglesias from the Reds, giving up 
pitcher Noe Ramirez and a player to be named later or cash. And then they have also acquired a uh, shortstop Jose Iglesias. Hence why we're saying they're not related um, from the Orioles, giving up uh, two minor league pitchers, uh, Gene Pinto and Garrett Stallings. So that's basically all I've got for the angels, but the Red Sox did acquire Johan Ibar from the Rockies and they're giving up infielder Kristen Koss. And I think I'm going to let the next one go to you because you were the one that told me about it in the first place. Yeah, it's uh, the, the White Sox making making some moves. And, and this is an interesting one. Lance Lynn, one of the really good stories, the feel-good stories of last year, I think he finished sixth or seventh in the Cy Young. Uh, really, really good year for a team that was really bad. Uh, the Rangers were definitely one of the top three. Okay, thank you. Definitely one of the three worst teams record wise uh, in the American league and definitely uh, overall in baseball, they go out, they, uh, they, tr- the right ra- Rangers, I should say, trade away Lance Lynn, the white Sox bring in Lance Lynn and they have an opportunity now. I mean, you got Lucas Giolito who obviously threw that uh, no hitter this year. You got Dallas Keuchel, who is a savvy veteran. A, you also have Dylan Cease who's getting there. He's one of the top pitchers in the white Sox. uh, um, at least uh, coming up through the uh, coming up through the White Sox minor leagues, he was there. And uh, Mitchell Kopchak, who's maybe a bit of a dark horse. There's some I- injury issues or some arm issues. They don't necessarily want to rush him, but you throw Lance Lynn in, and mm-hmm. you can go Giolito, Keuchel, and Lynn. That is something you can really play with in the in the playoffs, and that's something that the White Sox need to improve on. Because I think they got the the bats for it. Yeah, but Kopech also took the year off. Like, he opted out of the season. So you don't know how he's going to return anyway. Exactly. You know, especially a lot of the time with pitchers, rest isn't necessarily a good thing. A lot of the times you want to stay on the routine. And I'm not sitting saying he was on the couch eating Doritos for the last nine months. I'm pretty sure uh, he's had a lot of personal issues come up this year that I know about. So yeah. Everyone has their own reason, but um, he'll have to get back into it if he does want to be one of the five uh, starters for the White Sox. And I don't think the White Sox are done making moves. Going back to the Angels getting Rysel and Glacius, I think this is a really good move for the Angels to get a closer who I, I think he's probably one of the more reliable closers in all of baseball and to put him into the Anaheim setup, I think immediately that entire bullpen looks at him and they know that in the ninth inning, uh, three runs or less lead, he is getting the ball. That's that's nice for a bullpen. It, the, the rolls then, you know, shit rolls downhill, right? So the rolls roll downhill. Uh, once you know who your closer is, everything else just gets a little more easy, but the Angels can't be done, especially in the pitching department with, Jose and Glacius coming in, I think it does shut the door on Andrelton Simmons returning if the door was ever even open. And Tommy Listella. That's, I, I don't want to close the door on Tommy Listella. I don't want to either. Play, I, and, and I love Listella, but I don't think he was ever going to be a, uh, somebody that you want to be 162 game shortstop. He can play 150 games in four different positions, which is awesome, but no, I'm not going to close the door on Tommy LaStella. I'm still rooting for you on that part. And uh, I, I, I can't wait for that text from either you sending it to me or me seeing it and me being able to pass it along to you. I refuse to close the Tommy LaStella door just yet. Yeah. Well, going back to another former angel who got traded midseason, just like LaStella, um, the Reds had declined to tender contracts for Brian Goodwin, who was an outfielder um, that got traded to the Reds from the Angels. Archie Bradley... Kyle Farmer, Kirk Casali, and RJ Alanis. Yeah. I mean, who's going to take Brian Goodwin? I kind of want the Angels, but they are kind of stacked in the outfield department, yeah. so they don't need him. But I don't know where he would That's go. the, you know, I I would have to imagine Goodwin um, maybe possibly could be a guy who signs kind of later, um, mid-spring training if somebody goes down. Uh, a a non-roster invitee, if you will. And he's got speed. I think every team feels that if he's okay being the 26th man on the team that might only come in and pinch run three times a week, if he's okay with that, and he can play outfield as well, but he's not going to be your starter if you want to compete. 
Um, that would be interesting. Who knows? Maybe I, I've kind of fallen in love with, uh, not fallen in love, but definitely um, gained a, a healthy respect for the um, level of ball in Japan and Korea. I've seen plenty of players go and resurrect their career there. Sometimes it's a confidence thing. I was watching uh, my, my baseball team in Korea, the uh, um, NC Dinos. Anthony Altair was, you know, a guy who was a top prospect here, kind of faded out. He was one of the best players in Korea. Who knows? Maybe you get a second chance. We'll see about Goodwin. And I know I, I want to get your opinion on Kyle Schwarber. He was another non-roster or non-tender um, from the Cubs. Really a lot of central teams, either AL or NL central dropping players at the tender deadline. But Brianna, you're a, you're, your dog's named Wrigley. Number two team on your num, uh, on your love list is the Chicago Cubs. So what are your thoughts on Kyle Schwarber? Uh, days in Chicago officially at an end. I feel like that's kind of been the talk for the last couple of years, but officially. I mean, it's been talk for the last few years that that 2016 core is probably going to be splitting up in the next year or two anyway. So I don't think it matters. Yeah. I mean, he was a, basically a big bat for them. I didn't really see him as anything else. Yes, he played outfield, but he was more of a DH for me at least. Um, I mean, he can get his bat on the ball, but I know the Cubs – just about every single cup this last year was struggling. And that could be just due to how many games they had to play in a span of like two months, um, especially with some double headers due to the Cardinals. Oh, those Cardinals. Sorry. Um, I had to. Um, so, I mean, wherever they go, wherever he goes, he's probably just going to be a DH. Another player that got non-tendered, I believe was Albert Almora. Um, I mean, you don't see really much of him. You only ever hear about Chris Bryant, Anthony Rizzo, Javi Baez, obviously Addison Russell, but that's gone away in the last few years. <laughs> I could see. Give me face. start on Addison Russell. I'm sorry. I won't. Um, so, I mean, there's more bigger names on this team. Yes. Almora is great fielder, also a great hitter, but again, everybody was struggling and nobody's going to, the Cubs aren't going to keep that team together for much longer. They're going to have to bring in new people because every player is getting older. They're not hitting as well. They're getting slower. So it was going to happen eventually. Yeah. And uh, with Schwarber, I wonder, and uh, I'm sure this is probably somewhat of the case, the Cubs had advanced warning or they had known that, hey, uh, the universal DH will not be sticking around. So Kyle Schwarber's value just, I don't want to say plummeted, but, Whatever the arbitration number it was, was probably too high for them to justify a guy that they might have to hold their breath when he's out there in left field or wherever else they want to try and put him. But uh, Kyle Schwerber probably heading to the American League to be someone's DH. Another signing, um, a guy who's working his way towards a DH, he won't be playing DH. Uh, Carlos Santana signs with the Kansas City Royals signs a two-year $17.5 million deal. It's a guy who in 2020 hit only 199 batting average, but he did lead the league in walks with 47 and had a very good uh, on-base percentage of 349. He's expected to be the first baseman uh, with uh, Dozier moving across the diamond. Carlos Santana, $17.5 million dollars for a team that is not expected to compete any stretch of the imagination. Uh, this is, look, it's not my money. I don't know the financial situation of the uh, Kansas City Royals. Seems a bit of an overspend a little early on in free agency, but they apparently get their man at first base in Carlos Santana, 34 years old. I will point that out. He was an all-star two years ago. He is a switch hitter, so there is value there. Um, um, an another player that did sign, but not within the MLB, um, Domingo Santana um, signed with the Tokyo Colt Swallows. Um, so he's going to now be playing internationally, but he's also a Dominican Republic native. So I don't know how the language is going to go there, but um, he decided to go to Japan for who knows how long at this point. Um, and then I don't know if we talked about it last week, uh, but I know we talked about Mike Miner. Uh, Trevor May just signed with the Mets for two years and a 15 and a half million dollar contract. Yeah, that's uh, an early, I guess, first move 
for the Cohen brain trust. I don't know if it's official yet, or I know we're working towards that stage, but they're obviously probably hoping that uh, a, a Mr. Theo Epstein comes walking through that door very soon. Another, you know, kind of 2016 Cubs core that is breaking off, but does leave a little bit behind with Jed Hoyer, who he's worked with pretty much his entire career. So uh, we do the, just the last thing do want to talk about. It is uh, baseball related. We're both a little too young uh, to remember the uh, great Dick Allen, um, but he did pass, of course, this week. And he was a guy who in his day was one of the most feared power hitters in baseball. Um, and he unfortunately passes another, um, I don't want to, you know, discredit him or anything. Not not on the Lou Brock and some of the others we've lost, but another baseball legend that has uh, passed. And we do have one more after this. Uh, it was... Um, what was his first, what was the first name of the top uh, Japanese import? Uh, uh, upcoming? Yes. Uh, to Tomoyuki Sagano. Perfect. Yes, we are hearing uh, the Red Sox, an early lead. He uh, is, is probably the top Japanese import. Number two on most people's list behind Trevor Bauer in terms of starting pitchers available. And I know a uh, Mr. Shohei Otani is probably trying to pull a hell of a recruiting pitch and get Sagano to head uh, to Anaheim. What are your thoughts? Uh, if you, well, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. If you could get Sagano and another, maybe Sagano and Sonny Gray, or you only get Trevor Bauer, what do you <sighs> Yeah, I know. I had to, I had to make it somewhat difficult. I couldn't, I knew the answer. I had to throw in a to, another top pitcher with Sagana, but what are your thoughts um, uh, on that scenario? Or, um, you know, you don't have to play the hypothetical. You just give us our thoughts overall. Um, I'd still probably go with Bauer. Obviously Cy Young winner this year. I mean, Sagano is also 31. Trevor Bauer is still in his twenties. So there's a lot more time for Bauer than there is for Sagano. Obviously, Shohei Otani is going to be making that pitch. But Sagano is being put up for bidding starting tonight, ending uh, January 7th. Obviously, like Brandon said, Red Sox intend to be aggressive pursuers, but that's just a rumor. But other teams that are interested in him are the Giants, Padres, and Yankees. So what would happen if your Padres ended up getting him? You know, I, I feel like every time there's a top, Japanese import or Asian import, whether it's Jap Japan, Korea, or the, you know, uh, Chinese Taipei, the Padres names brought up. Uh, the only time that I ever got the feeling that they actually would have a chance to get um, a Japanese or uh, an Asian import, if you will, was Shohei Otani. It was, it was down to the wire. The Padres, yeah, that's honestly no, no disrespect, but everything that's gone on with him, it's, it's, it's okay. Um, he can still Angels, hit though. Oh yeah, definitely. But the Angels are that team that can, they they can go out and spend that type of money. And if it doesn't quite work out, they're still okay because they have bankroll behind them. The Padres aren't. Um, so, you know, the Angels, they, they're sticking with Otani as they should, no doubt about it. But um, they, that loss financially uh, isn't as bad as it would have been for the Padres. But for Sagano, getting him would be okay but i don't I've, I've said from the beginning it is number one goal needs to be signed fernando tatis jr to an extension no other money should be spent until fernando tatis jr is signed through his 20 year 28 season 28 year old season maybe 30 if you want to sign him to a 10-year deal i mean that has to be goal number one everything else will fall into place. But, you know, this Fernando Tatis Jr., I've, I've been a pan, fan of this team my entire life. Unfortunately, this team has put me in the spot where if they do what they've done with their top players overall, I will no longer be a fan. Uh, that's just the fact of it. I've been a guy that says you can't leave your team, blah, blah, blah. But if they get rid of Fernando Tatis Jr. because they couldn't afford him while I spend $15 for a Coors Light at Petco, that just doesn't add up to me. So they need to sign him to an extension. Everything else after that, gravy. The hardest part with the Padres um, is their neighbors. 
there is nothing the Padres can do this off season that is going to get them on the level with the Dodgers. And that can go for the next two off seasons. And another part It'd of it is that, because bets assigned to more than yeah. two years. And, and, and they, and we've seen how the Dodgers do it. They bring up Gonsolins and Mays and Muncie's and they just recycle players that turn out other teams. hate, don't like them. They bring them in their MVP caliber. So the Padres have a lot to deal with. Um, Sagano is not anything near the answer. It has to be Fernando Tatis Jr. or bust. It's the only thing I want this off season, but that is also with the um, knowledge that we're probably at best a wild card team next year. So I don't have high hopes. I know I'm one of the more pessimistic Padre fans, but I mean, what type of positivities have they thrown my way? Uh, so that was, I guess, kind of my final thoughts. I think that's all we have this week uh, as we get one week deeper into the off season and one week closer to baseball season. Brianna, what are your final thoughts for another, the 10th episode of the change up? I mean, you probably know what I'm going to say. First off Bauer, please come to the angels. I see you tweeting at angels fans. Come on, just, just stop playing with us. Um, and then obviously just whoever gets Schwarber will have a good DH, Almora fielding. I mean, whoever gets Sagano, I mean, we're not going to probably know this for at least another month um, since the bidding won't end until December, or sorry, January 7th. But if the Red Sox can get him, I mean, they've got somewhat of, a, they'll have somewhat of a good bullpen. I mean, that's not going to say anything about the rest of their team. Um, they're still going to be in rebuild mode um, based on what this year looked like. Uh, but that's my final thoughts. Yeah. And, and just one last thing there on the Sagano, it is a little different for Sagano and the Asian imported players. Uh, there is a posting fee that will be needed essentially a, an auction, a, a bidding process. All the teams in major league baseball will put out a bid to the, uh, team that uh, Sagano is a part of at the moment. Uh, the highest bid will give the rights to that team to negotiate a contract. So you're almost paying twice for this player. Yet another reason why I don't think the Padres should be in this. Uh, there's no need to throw $15 at a Japanese team just to sign a guy that you really don't know. Um, but once again, it's not my money. So who am I to say, but once again, Fernando Tatis Jr. leaves, as do I. I just follow him wherever he goes. He's my favorite player. Uh, and I, I'm putting it in stone now here in the 10th episode of The Change Up. For Brianna Winner, my name is Brandon First, a.k.a. First Report, representing the Off the Bench Podcast Network. Thank you, Brianna. Thank you, everyone, for listening to the 10th episode of The Change Up. We will talk to you all next week. It's time for y'all to go wash your hands and stop hating everybody. Take care. Okay.